Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Google Play, and a whole bunch of other venues. Just visit our sites, chimeraobscura.com slash vm or vmspod.com to find more information, along with our RSS feed. And follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod. Well, as uh, as promised, I, I took a week off from the show so I could host my pharma conference in Maryland without the, well, the added craziness of, of putting up an episode, writing the email, um, you know, doing the social media stuff, blah, blah, blah. Um, I will say when Monday's drive down to Bethesda passed the five hour mark instead of the 405 it should have taken, um, I was increasingly happy with my decision to, to just not have this hanging over my head. But... Now we are back, and um, I don't know where to begin. Really, the uh, the past two weeks, you know, just the the eight days spanning um, era of Yom Kippur and the drive home from my conference that Tuesday when I posted the last episode to Wednesday evening, it transformed me in, in a lot of ways. I would. Um, I would go into it here, but <laughs> we'd never get to the show. And this one is a fun conversation, so um, I will get to it momentarily. Um, but for anyone who was on a cliffhanger after the last episode, wondering how my conference was going to go, doing an in-person show again for the first time in three years, etc., it went fine. Uh, we had about 50 attendees, another 15 or so speakers, and a, a dozen virtual attendees who I was monitoring on an iPad on Zoom to make sure everything was working for them, too. And, well, one man wrecking crew that I am, I um, I managed the entire shebang with barely a stumble. Um, I maintained my, my Mr. Wonderful persona throughout. Um, I managed to pre-apologize to the hotel staff and the AV people, etc., to let them know that if I was being curt or otherwise seeming rude, it's not about them. It's just about me. And, and doing that, I think, kept me from even, you know, bordering into that sort of territory, even when there were some AV issues that needed to be sorted out at the last minute. Anyway, uh, on top of all that, I seem not to have contracted COVID. Uh, if my at-home tests are to be trusted, uh, even though I was maskless in all the conference settings, the the big amphitheater we used for the, the conference itself, uh, the, the area right outside for the networking reception, the uh, Fogo de Chao dinner we had nearby, I masked up walking through the restaurant, but in the private room where we had <coughs> about 40, 45 people, um, yeah, stayed unmasked and... and Somehow it all worked. Oh, and I, I got my bivalent vax yesterday along with my flu shot. So if I sound like I'm going to pass out, that'll explain that. But but really, there is too much to tell. Um, I learned some things about myself in that, that whole eight day or so span. Um, I did some things that were very much out of character for me, but very necessary. And I managed to keep a, a professional face on, like I said, um, it was um, God, it, it was something. Maybe I'll write about it in the email, or I'll just write a, a long blog post since nobody reads blogs. We'll see. For now, on with the show. So my guest this week is Tom Gauld, uh, who has a brand new book out called Revenge of the Librarians from Drawn and Quarterly. This is a collection of Tom's weekly literary cartoons from The Guardian in the U.K., and it's an absolute delight. Um, as we talk about in the episode, I'm used to seeing Tom's cartoons on, on Twitter and having a laugh in that format. But there's something else when they're reproduced here in print, larger scale, subtler colors and, and line work, all the stuff that you don't see on the screen. And seeing them collected like this and, and you know, being able to compare, you know, strip after strip, um, it really does work fantastically. And on top of all that, his strips are incredibly funny. Uh, for years now, Tom's managed a weekly poke at literature, authors, the publishing world, uh, bookstores, festivals, editors, writers, malaise, uh, specific authors who we'll talk about like Jane Austen and Samuel Beckett and all these other aspects of the book world. 
And one of the fun things about the this collection in particular, Revenge of the Librarians, which covers a lot of his pandemic era comics, especially, is seeing how Tom stretches himself. And he has this this simplified cartoon figures, which you'd recognize in a heartbeat, these little sort of triangular people with, with knobby hands. Um, but he's, he's working in more complicated modes now. And he manages to play with the comics form, you know, sticking with the, the horizontal strip, you know, shape and all this, but using these, these humorous charts and, and Venn diagrams and, and board games and other models without ever losing the laughs. And, the other thing about seeing the work collected like this is that it's a really impressive reminder of the degree of consistency Tom has to bring to the table. Because he also does another weekly comic for the new, uh, for new Scientist magazine. And just seeing how much work it takes to, to keep from making the same joke. I always say that um, <laughs> this is nothing about Tom at all. Anyone who has a regular column will invariably reach the point of... I'm not justifying Hitler, but, you know, they, they'll always run out of ideas and something absolutely absurd will, will end up showing up in their column. Tom doesn't do that. He stays funny. He doesn't, um, well, we talk about how strips occasionally, you know, um, hit the Gary Larson, uh, it's funny to me and nobody else mode, but but he manages to hit an awfully high batting average here. So um, now beyond that, it's also interesting how he manages to well to challenge himself as an artist, and again that that weekly parameter, uh, you know that that constraint I guess is a really important thing, because it, it's got him using new new well trying to come up with new uses of color and and forms and even scenes and settings he's you know not accustomed to, and watching that play out over the course of Revenge of the Librarians as well as the earlier collections like uh, uh, You're All Jealous of My Jetpack and, and Baking with Kafka. That's one of the things I um, that I love most about this this self-appointed gig of mine. It's, it's watching artists progress. Anyway, uh, Tom and I talked in 2016, which is why I'm talking about him as a, a you know, a punctuated visitor of the show. Um, we had a, he had a uh, full length graphic novel out at the time, also from Drawn and Quarterly called Moon Cop. I suggest you, you give that episode a listen to. In that one, we talk more about his, his art and cartooning upbringing, and I think it, it helps give a, a fuller picture of the guy you're going to hear in just a moment. Um, but I'm always interested in, in how my guests and their work change over time. And, and in Tom's case, I think the lockdown-related comics here really reveal another aspect of his creativity that, uh, that may have gone untapped otherwise. Oh, yeah, I should note, we recorded this one in person because Tom was out on a book tour and was in Brooklyn. And, um, well, we, we crammed into a very tiny hotel room that he had. And, uh, uh, well, not tiny, smallish, but there were also not much by way of chairs. But anyway, we set the mics up on corners of the bed and, and talked. And, well, you'll hear it. Now, here's Tom's bio from the book. Tom Gauld was born in 1976 and grew up in Aberdeenshire, Scotland. He is a cartoonist and illustrator. His work is published in The Guardian, The New Yorker, and New Scientist. He lives in London with his family, and his new book is Revenge of the Librarians. And now, the 2022 Virtual Memories Conversation with Tom Gall. Lockdown-era cartooning. Yes. You know, um, how different was it for you? How, how was the experience of lockdown and trying to do two weekly comics the way it did, especially the ones that went into to this collection? Well, I guess my, in my, my life, I had went through the same things as most people, a kind of uh, terror and uh, horror at the beginning, ter sort of turning into a sort of stuck-at-home boredom. And I, I don't think my experience was that unusual, but it turned out to be kind of a good time for my cartooning. Mm -hmm. I think I think I sort of realised my job here in both cases where the newspapers and the scientific magazines are just full of this story. My job is just to, 
either do something which is genuinely funny about it or just ignore it and carry on doing what I'm doing and give people a laugh. And I sort of moved between those two choices. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, I, I like the cartoons every week to be quite different from the week before. But looking back on it as we made the book, I was sort of thinking, do I want to put in those pandemic ones? Should we take them out? Should we corral them into a pandemic section? Yeah. But I kind of thought they stood up quite well anyway. And I think the fact that everybody was going through this same experience meant I could make cartoons which played off that in a kind of fun way. And I'm always looking for ways to make the cartoons, um, well, well, to, 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 to talk about life at the moment. So it was a good moment where there was a nice big story which you couldn't ignore. I think we'd all hope there's a future where your your those strips are dated and no one knows what you're talking about. I, I kind of doubt the world's going to get to that point ever. But you know, I'd, I'd love for a moment to be kids looking. Why are they talking about lockdowns? I don't understand. What's any of this about? But yes, well, the know. specifics of it. Yeah, I think especially in the UK where they 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 didn't handle it very well, and we flip flopped from one thing to the next. Yeah. We went through a lot of different types of lockdown and. Um, and different rules we had to follow. So some of those cartoons are playing with the, the wording of those rules, yeah. which um, <clears throat> was very specific and, and everybody knew it at the time. But hopefully in the future, they yeah. will we can only stand pray. up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I'll say when we, we spoke six years ago, which doesn't seem like six years, but half of that's been taken up by the pandemic. You mentioned how walks and coffee shops were your two most important uh, yes. <laughs> important things in terms of creativity and art. So I imagine that that was severely curtailed. Did you, uh, again, adjust, adjust, or just find that, well, maybe those things weren't as essential as I thought? Or um, were you dying to get back to them? Is, is, you know. Yeah, well, the coffee shops part definitely closed down, and I just had to drink coffee at home. Um, and in the, f I think in the first lockdown, we spent it in the countryside where my wife's family are. Okay. And so I had the walks, but instead of them being through London, they were <clears throat> up the Yorkshire Dales and down the valleys, which turned out to work fine. Um, I think the coffee shops I've gone back to and, and I do like that sort of hubbub of things going on around me, but there was something nice about walking with the birds uh, in the hills, which which kind of work, worked out in the end. See, I, I live out in the woods. So I was telling you where I live. It's really wooded, and, and I mention it on the show all the time. It's literally like bear wandering around in the, the backyard along with deer right. and wild turkey and snakes and everything. But uh, but you don't get all that in England, so that's that's good. So no. <laughs> At least the bear part of it. But but tell me about just trying to, to keep the literary humor going. I mean, again, we, we talked six years ago, and you managed to keep a weekly run going. I've managed to keep this going weekly, and the ability for me is because there's always somebody different that I'm talking to. But in your terms, trying to, to you know stay fresh and keep a. Well, I think the thing which maybe helps, which is um, is the specificity of it, is that it has to be about books and literature, yeah. and all, there's always new books being published and new things happening so the fact that it is it does have this theme which interests me and things are constantly happening then that inspires me and the other thing i suppose is is the the the, the playfulness of cartooning you know i like experimenting um quite structural experiments with the cartoon sometimes think well, what if I do try and squeeze as many panels in here as possible or can I make a funny cartoon which runs back to front or th that sort of constraint is, is what I go for when when I'm stuck when I don't see something in the week which I think oh that'll make a good cartoon then I I might go come at it from the opposite angle like oh I'd really like to um, do loads of cross hatching and have it look really dark, yeah. and then I sort of reverse engineer that into the world of science or um, literature. Yeah. How so, do I make this more complex for myself? <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> a yeah. great way to approach it. I've been basically needlessly complicating my own life, but you know, I, I get right. that that's a uh, approach. Do you? Um, again, something we talked about the first time we, we recorded. Get better with hands. Are, you, are um, our hands still there? No, <laughs> the I don't nemesis. get better because I avoid them. And I think there's two things you can do with drawing and cartooning when 
when you're not good at something. You either just head on, hit it and work on it and get better, or you write your way around it. And the problem with writing your own cartoons is you can write your way around things your whole career. And I did draw, I found a, a Czech artist whose hands I really loved and he had a, a beautiful way of because you're always going to have to simplify hands in a cartoon. You can't draw them as they exist because the drawings are just too small. So you need to find a short, a short hand yeah. for hands. <laughs> um, and this guy, whose name has popped out of my head, had great hands. So I, I went through the book copying every one of his hands and thought, next time I do a, a, com a comic that needs hands, I'm going to draw them like this. Yeah. But I'm just too used to writing my way around them or zooming out <laughs> whenever anyone's holding something. So and you have I the haven't whole used them Rings yet. of Power thing going on now, the, the Tolkien adaptation and all that. The, uh, uh, on Amazon, they're, they're doing all the oh, yes, Tolkien. Yeah. So, you know, presumably at some point there'll be a ring on a, a hand to, to draw. But. Yeah, although I just, I find if I draw stick men and they're holding something, I just make it enormous. So in my, in my world, the Rings of Power would be big enough to be held by a stick man. So about six inches round, I guess. When you mentioned the size of the, the strips, you know, it's something that I, I guess didn't occur to me when we recorded last time, reading the book this time and just seeing, as somebody in America, my experiences with your comics is primarily through Twitter mm -hmm. images of course, and, yeah. you know, that, that smaller repro and seeing them in this book, they feel fuller. And I don't know, you know, what size you're drawing, uh, you know, versus how they're reproduced in the book, how they're reproduced in the Guardian or the, the New Scientist. Um, but, you know, how important was that for you, I guess, in terms of having a, a kind of full size representation of what you what you draw? Well, and what are we missing when we see it on Twitter is the other question. But Well, I'm 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 lucky um, talking about the Twitter side that I do make cartoons, which I started doing before Twitter existed in The Guardian, but they are quite a Twitterable, shareable size. Yeah, yeah their format um, is, is yeah, nice. Yeah, they're and, formatted yeah. very well for Twitter, maybe not quite so well for Instagram, which likes things squared. But that's a great way to share the cartoons. I sort of see that they have these three lives in the paper where they're surrounded by the book's pages. So they have this specificity where they're tied to the literature pages, then this kind of crazy free-for-all where they're just in the sort of tumble dryer of things flying around on Twitter, where I sort of feel they need to stand up more on their own. And then when they sort of come back and are collected in a book with their brothers and sisters and have this sort of... The, the, the person who reads that wants to read it and picks up the book and knows what they're getting. So I like it if the cartoon can kind of survive those three stages. Um... I mean, this book is unusual because as a newspaper cartoonist, the, the worrying time is when they have a redesign mm -hmm. or when the editor changes. Because at th those points, somebody might choose to bring in a new cartoonist or get rid of some of the old white male cartoonists. Yeah. And I've been very lucky that I've survived a few of these changes and, um, and redesigns. And th this selection in this book was... Four years when there was a lovely little magazine, the review, which used to be big, became this lovely little magazine and my strip was on the back page and it got a bit longer than it used to be. So this book is a bit longer and thinner than the previous ones. And I got a little bit more space in the paper. Okay, maybe I, that's what I'm, I'm noticing, because I, I don't recall seeing your strip. My, my copies of your other collections are walled off like the cask of Amontillado by right. my wife and, and, you know, her photography props. But, you know, going through, I'm like, I don't recall ever. You know, cause kind of seeing the, the breadth of the, the, the line like this. Well, we, we, the, the design changed, so the book changed, and actually The Guardian has since had another redesign and put me back to the old size oh. cartoon. <laughs> so this book actually very neatly covers, ex I got almost exactly enough book cartoons from that time when they were that shape. And may maybe there was... Maybe that changed my thinking a little. There was sort of, sort of space for an extra panel or a little bit of extra stuff. So I maybe did start drawing them a little bit bigger for this thing, for this book. And it means we could, instead of trying to squeeze them into a book which matched the others on the shelf, we thought, let's, let's just follow, follow this thing and make a long, thin book and, mm. and, and just say this is different and these are different strips. So that, that's kind of fun. Good. The... Um 
Well, the Cask of Amontillado reference, feel free to, to steal that at some point if you have a Poe slash, you know, people's yeah, comics getting walled in. I'm that's, always looking for ideas. <laughs> you know, that's something I've fallen back on a whole bunch of times. I can always rely on Poe. But um, when we talked before, you, you'd mentioned having some more long form ideas. We, mm. we, we spoke around Moon Cop. Okay, yeah. And um, since then, you have published a, a children's book, which... I miss because I don't have children and I'm, I'm not in that three to six age range. So yeah, you know, I, sure. I, I didn't, but I'll go back and check it out. But are you working on a, on long form stuff right now? Or is that the worst question possible I could ask? <laughs> well, no, well, it is in a sense. I mean, the fact that I was talking then about having some ideas, I sort of got to a point where I had a, because I do these two weekly cartoons, I don't have a huge amount of other time to work on projects. So I can sort of have one project on at a time. And I got to a point where I realized I either need to do this kid's book or I need to get on with one of these graphic novel ideas. And I thought, even though my kids are already, it took me so long to write this kid's book that my kids were already too old for it by the time I did it. But I thought I'd like to do it while they are... Um, children and so I decided to do the kids book and that was the project that luckily I'd started before the whole COVID lockdowns thing so I could work on finishing that up during COVID um, and my plan was I'll do the kids book and then when that's done I will do a new graphic novel and I sort of got a bit distracted by COVID and by putting this new book out but when I finish touring this, it's back to London and my main project will be a new graphic novel for grown-ups because as hard as they are for me to do, I just love drawing comics and on this tour I've been sort of meeting with some cartoonists and people have been giving me books and I, I'm just sort of sort of itching to yeah. to um to make something. Tell me about the tour. How how much were you looking forward to just getting out and, and doing this? Not sitting down with me, of course, which is the worst part of it. But, no, but not, all the not other at good all. stuff. <laughs> I was looking forward to it because I had two tours cancelled. I had one for my science cartoons and one for my kids' book, both of which got cancelled. Um, for my science cartoon, but I got one event done on the kind of world tour in Germany, in Berlin. And then the next day, everything in Germany shut down and I went back to the UK. Um, so it's nice to be back out and... I'm in the North, I'm in North America for two weeks and I've had a really, I'm halfway through now, had a great time in the last week. Tom Devlin, the creative director. Oh, I think he's got a new title since then. Anyway, something like that. One of the bosses yeah. at Drawn and Quarterly very kindly took a week out of the office and has been driving me around. So we've been driving and chatting about comics and having a really nice time and visiting Toronto. We went to Detroit, but actually I had an event in Ann Arbor and Chicago. And then we we separated at Chicago and he went back and I'm on my own for the second week. But no, it's been great. I've really enjoyed getting out and reading the cartoons live and meeting people. Uh, I haven't had a signing yet that I haven't had at least one librarian come along <laughs> to. So that's kind of cool. You understand what we're going through in America with, with libraries and, and book banning right now? Has that been a thing that's covered? Book banning is outside? not a thing that we do in uh, the UK. Oh, I just mean to, have you been hearing about what we're going through? Well, here? yes, I have heard okay. of that. I mean, we have the government is, is not great on libraries and they have been cutting their funding and treating them very badly. But books tend not to get banned. I imagine there's some structural reason that that doesn't tend to happen. But yeah, I keep meaning to do a cartoon about banned books, but I haven't quite figured out how to do it yet. I'm sure over the, the two weeks, yeah, something, something will hit you hopefully. for a time here. Yeah, it's um, it's been disturbing and weird to, to see happen. But which cartoonists have you uh, gotten to hang with during this, this trip? Well, Tom did a great job of making us plans to visit lots of people. We went to visit Seth in Guelph, who is one of my favorite cartoonists and has an amazing home um, full of his art and uh, just I incredible. He, he's, he, treat, he almost treats his whole life as, a, as an extension of his art. Uh, in a way which is incredibly impressive. I'm not like that. I kind of do the drawings as my job and my life is not a work of art. My wife's an artist, so she makes things beautiful in the house. But he, What sort of art does she make? 
She makes, I suppose, conceptual art, a lot of text pieces, stitching and beading and things. Mm. We met at art school where we were both, I think, luckily working on completely different styles of art, yeah. which means we can both cross over and appreciate each other's work, but there's no... There's no rivalry or, or difficulty. I, I always ask cartoonist couples, like, do, do you, are you deliberately unfunny around your partner just for fear they're going to steal one of your jokes? If you say <laughs> they always say no, but I think deep down. They, they right. Do. But, but, yeah. but yeah, you got to see Seth and the... Uh, we saw Seth and his amazing home. And then... Did he make a little U for, for Dominion? Did he put a little little figure in there? That's, that's... I don't know. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, he, maybe, he did, maybe he would have done, but it was great just seeing his original art oh. and... Um, it just what that was wonderful, and then where did we go? We went to um, well in Chicago. Oh no, in, to, in Toronto we had a wonderful dinner with Michael DeForge and Gillian Tamaki, mm -hmm. both of whose work I adore. So that was great. And then we went to in Chicago. I met up with Ivan Bunetti and Kevin Heisenga, both of whose work I've I've loved for years. I was Ivan and I were talking about the fact. I think I sent him some emails when I was in college in like 1997 and I saw his work on the high water. The, the schizo comics? Yeah, well, they were, they were being published on the high water books website yeah. as single pages, as daily comics. Okay. There was him and a bunch of other artists who were a big influence on my early work. So it was nice to finally meet him in person yeah. after having corresponded probably like, almost 25 years ago. Yeah, it's weird when that hits you, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah we absolutely. haven't been around that long. This couldn't possibly be. You know. <laughs> yeah. I had a business trip to uh, to Michigan a couple of weeks ago, and it was the, oh, wait a second, that had to be 2001 when I was here last. And you realize that something in your professional life should not be over 20 years old. But no, yeah, here we in are. 2001, be, being 22 years ago, it feels weird. But yeah. anyway. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It was yeah. just the, well, that couldn't possibly be the case. But you know, the company that flew me out there got bought a year later, and boom, you know. I wondered about Ivan because it, in the book, there's a couple of, of close-up faces mm. that on the surface one would say, oh, that's a little Chris Ware influence. But they actually feel a little like Ivan iconography uh, somehow. I'd, yeah. I'd have to, to pull a couple out of there. But No, I think you're right. I think they're probably – that. that's probably true that, that I, I obviously uh, love Chris Ware's work and I, I was, was influenced by – you know, his more, I was going to say gag cartooning style. I mean, it's still kind of yeah, amazing, unusual, existential, Chris yeah. Ware, <laughs> deep, thoughtful stuff. But his his more gag cartoon look stuff was yeah. an influence. But I think Ivan's work and then those books he wrote on cartooning were all influences on me. And yeah, that idea of keeping... I started off all my figures were stick figures, so that kept things simple. But then once I, I suppose mainly for the joke cartoon, sometimes wanted a figure who was bigger, but still with that openness for the reader to project onto, yeah. then yes, I ended up with those incredibly simple dot for eye, line for nose, circle for head characters, which are definitely influenced by Ivan. And no mouths, which is always, now that I've started drawing, I understand the mm. importance of not drawing a mouth. That's really, the, if there's anything that will screw up a drawing faster, it's it's just trying to do the mouth, I've discovered. But Yes, it's tricky. And for my kids' book, I had to draw some mouths. Yeah. I tr it, it's called The Little Wooden Robot and the Log Princess. And I tried to have the robot with just a blank screen for a face and was sold very early on. You can't do that in kids', kids book. Kids will freak out. He needs, he needs a face and he needs to smile. So learning to draw smiles was one of the challenges of that kid's book. But off the back of it, I feel like, yeah, I've sort of, I learned something there. And maybe, you know, also the, the kid's book had to be a bit more colorful than my usual work. And I think I learned, I learned things about color by confronting that, that in the kid's book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How has the drawing changed for you? Well, again, we'll just say it's been a six year gap that we've talked. Do you, mm. do you see differences in your work? I, I know you had the strip down thing, but, but... Yeah, I mean, I think it's in some ways I've gotten more comfortable using colour. Mm -hmm. And at my earliest cartoons were very much... Well, were all self-published scenes in black and white. Yeah. And then when I started getting illustration work, I was told you can't work... If, if, 
if the magazine is paying to be in colour, you've got to give them some colour. Yeah. And I begrudgingly used colour at the beginning. And I've sort of got more comfortable with it now. And I, I'd say that's a change, is I, I don't have to crosshatch um, to, to feel a drawing is, is complete, whereas I did used to feel that. I've got, I've got used to using colour as colour. And I suppose things have maybe tightened up and neatened up a bit. Sometimes I think that's good, and sometimes I think, oh, I should, I should loosen up and work quicker. But it's, it, there's always tiny little pushes and pulls, which perhaps the audience don't even notice that I'm sort of feel like big changes for me. But, but they, they, I tend to stay in the same area. Yeah, I just wasn't sure if there's a, beyond the topicality or the topics themselves of the strips, you know, that sense of you can look at something and, oh, that was 2018. That's what mm. I was doing, you know, X, Y, or Z. I think X, vis- y, or Z. Visually, <laughs> visually, things haven't changed that much. I think conceptually, I've got better. I've got better at writing jokes and I've maybe got better at writing words. I was very much an illustrator who was having to put some words into his cartoons. Mm-hmm. And the first collection of these Guardian cartoons was a there was some in there which now I probably wouldn't have put in a collection. They were just odd rather than funny. Yeah. Um, whereas I think this book is is probably my favourite collection. And I've over there I've been doing these weekly strips for seventeen years. I've sort of well, I've got better, and I think I. I yeah, that's always uh, a question for me. Like where, how you see the improvement in your own work or the progress? We'll say. Mm. I think it's just more. When I put this book together, the amount of cartoons in the file that I said, oh, I don't want to put that one in the book because it was on a weekly schedule. You're always going to have some that aren't great. But the amount that are unsuitable for a book has gone down. So I think mathematically that's an improvement. I do have to say my great disappointment with this book. Not that you want to hear this sort of thing, but (laughs) you didn't end with the Beckett advent calendar. It's about three or four from the end, but that one, right. I just, well, clearly, that should be the, the finale and the showstopper, but we all have our, our particular tastes. <laughs> yes, and it's always a challenge with these cartoons, knowing what references to use. You know, I never want anybody to feel, oh, this is a joke for people who've studied X, Y, or Z. Yeah. And Beckett, I, I actually love and can squeeze in nerdy references that people who know his work like. But I always try and tie it back enough to the general cultural idea so you can enjoy it for that reason. But I know I'm always slightly... I'm sort of too drawn to Beckett and I have to hold back and not do too many cartoons about him. Well, that was the a live episode I did with Joe Chardello, uh, illustrator, great mm-hmm. illustrator at the yeah, New Yorker. Yeah. Um, someone asked him in the audience... <clears throat> favorite person to draw, favorite literary figure to draw. And he said Beckett. And just, you know, obviously the lines, the shape mm. of the face, the intensity of the eyes, etc. And then someone asked, you know, about, you know, his favorite Beckett. He said, oh, I don't really read him. I just love drawing <laughs> him. It's just this face that works perfectly for Joe's line. But. Well, also some, some people, he is great for cartooning in the sense that there's a, there's a common idea of him, which even if you've never seen um, waiting for Godot, you kind of know the iconog- yeah. iconography of it and the idea of it. He's also stripped down visually, which is kind of brilliant for me. There's black humor in there. Uh, so he's, and, and I love his work. So he's the kind of perfect person to um, yeah. make cartoons about. And I, what was I was doing? I think I, 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 I did a cartoon rec- with it, probably in this book where I, I, I thought I'm going to do it about Nietzsche. But then I just I didn't have enough of an idea of his work and I, I didn't I didn't want to get it wrong. And so I think in the end, I okay. changed it back to being maybe it was going to be a Nietzsche advent calendar. I can't remember. <laughs> yeah, that, that'd be a little. Well, yeah. I'm sure you'd make it funny. Well, but, he's but, trickier. Yeah. And, and Beckett's Beckett's very useful. And Jane Austen's another person who is very <laughs> useful because she well, partly because I like her work. I, I did about three cartoons about her before I read any of her work <laughs> because there's such a great idea of what her work is which yeah. is what i play off but since then i've read some of the books so i can i can have little extras from mm. the from from real knowledge in there too and are the strips still uh, thematically suggested by the guardian or are you a little freer now in terms of what you're going to do from week to week yeah that is a change actually when 
I started, they were on the letters page. Yeah, that's what, when we recorded, you, you yeah. mentioned it okay. was... Okay, so that, yeah. probably when I was speaking to you, that was beginning to change just because fewer people write to letters pages. And so not long after we talked last time, I, I was sort of severed from the letters and was just allowed to do a literary cartoon every week. And sometimes the editor of the book section will say, could we have something about, you know... X, Y, or Z. And sometimes I might just, when I'm emailing her, say, I'd say if there's anything coming up in the next few weeks that might be interesting, let me know. But most of the time I'm coming up with my own themes, you know, based on, obviously I want to hit things like New Year, Christmas, Halloween. Yeah. So there's that. And then anything that's happening in books that seems interesting to me. And also just, you know, Something will happen, and I think, well, that'll make a good cartoon. And I'm freer now to do my to do my own thing, which is nice. Do you get invited to publishing parties and events, or are they kind of skittish? Oh God, I don't want to, you know, lampooning us in the the, the strip in any way. I think both with my literary cartoons and my science cartoons, people seem to like them. Even the people in publishing who mm. I'm making fun of, and obviously. Humor is things going wrong generally, yeah. and it's people failing, and it's uh, it's it's not a publisher who you have a great relationship and have a lovely driving tour around North America with. It's things going wrong. So my publishers all seem very forgiving about my cartoons about useless publishers, and hopefully my uh, writer friends don't mind my sort of vain and stupid writers who appear in the <laughs> cartoons it's just it's just the way it goes but i think i think it's done in my case not with a desire to to skewer these people it's a sort of gentle teasing from a friend and i think people kind of appreciate that hmm. have you seen any of your work done through that whole ai thing by the way as far as the science strips go especially mm. has anyone done the you know tom gold style AI, this, that, and the other. Dave McKean and I sat down for a conversation ah, about okay. this. That was, uh, of course you did, yeah, because he did that book of them. Yeah, the moment I saw it coming out, I'm like, Dave, can we do a conversation? Because I'd really love to hear what you have to say about this. Yes, and, uh, well, I should listen to that because I'd love to hear what he has to say. Um, I saw somebody did it and shared it with me, and it didn't really work. It came up with, I think because most of my stuff, which is on the internet, is comics, so it's not single images. Yeah. So I think the AI had got confused. And it was, it was sort of like if you looked at one of my comics from a distance with your eyes shut. Um, so it didn't, as soon as you looked, it didn't have anything. It was some suggestions of cross-hatching. I mean, that's, I think that's the thing people forget about this AI, is it's, it's stealing your work. It's hoovering it up for free on the internet and turning it, collaging it into a... Uh, into a new work of art and in quotes yeah. yes and yeah. if you it I, I wonder if somebody's going to invent an algorithm which can reverse engineer how they got it because obviously it's it's about taking your work and feeding it into their machine which which kind of feels wrong to me um there's a thing in design and i i guess in um movie making and things the mood board where before you start a project you go online and take all the things which kind of relate to it and you show it to to people to to explain the sort of thing you're thinking and it feels like that's sort of what it's doing but without hiring an artist at the end to bring their own taste to it yeah that's um, certainly dave's experience was that you could replace my commercial art by doing this and that's not really cool if an art director decides we don't need the artist anymore we'll just yeah and i i think it, it, there's also a type of artist whose job it is to make those rough paintings for the beginning of a sci-fi movie and those people might find that 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 the director is quicker for them to type a few searches into things but generally i think they're so bad um i I'm not, I don't think I'm as worried as I feel like Dave is from, hit, from the, the short interview I saw. Mm -hmm. I saw, I think he's, he would not be out of the job because he's being paid for his amazing taste yeah, and he, he imagination. Knows. It's just a, a different thing that he'll, he'll, I don't say exploit, but that he, he yeah. leverages, you know, he's got those, he's Dave McKean. And yeah. we'll just... <laughs> I don't think he needs to worry. And I think if you write stories, we're, we're a way off 
off anything which can write those. So fingers crossed things are all right for mm -hmm. a little while. Yeah. <laughs> and again, yeah, until they figure out how to do interviews as, as haltingly and, and terribly as I do, you know, I, I figure <laughs> we'll, we'll, I'll have a future with this stuff for sure. But, but yeah, that, that sense of, well, getting on a tour and getting out of England in time for the queue and, and the funeral, was that important also <laughs> as far as... Um, yeah, it was, it was weird Yeah, because there was no warning and we sort of went, I, I was working late at my studio because in order to do a tour like this, I need to file a bunch of cartoons before I go. Mm. I don't like working on the road. So I was working hard to get these extra cartoons done and I worked late and it was so late I decided to get a taxi home. Um... And I, I said to the taxi, it was pouring with rain, and I said to the taxi driver, oh, this is good for you, the rain, because, you know, people will want a ride. And he was like, oh, no, it's quiet tonight. And I said, why is that? And he said, Queen's dead, isn't it? Which was just <laughs> such a weird way to hear. Um, and I was like, oh, really? Um, and I'm not a big monarchist, but we, it was a strange time for, especially the, the 10 days of national mourning where mm. all the music on the radio was muted and all these strange things happened and I've been to France and been here since then and have been asked a lot about um my feelings about monarchy which I sort of have to feel, feel to have to think well what what do I think because it's 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 not a big thing yeah. uh in my life I know uh Woody Phoenix flipped out on me once for making a reference to the show the crown in the weekly email that I put out because he felt that he thought it was a sign that I was one of these these you know royal geeks or something. I'm like, no, right. no my wife was watching, and I just said, oh, Tobias Menzies, I like watching that guy, and that, yeah. that was pretty much it. But yeah, it, it it elicits strong reactions, and I wasn't sure with the Scottish background, you know, what, what mm. that means for you. But you know, um, but getting out of the country, I guess, was probably a good thing uh, in terms of. Yeah, I was in France while the the, the most intense days of mourning were happening in London, which was. Quite, quite nice to get away from that. I, I, I could imagine. So you mentioned the kids uh, earlier when you were talking about the, the children's book and um, doing my calculations from our, our previous conversation. They're like 14 and 17 or good, so. Good work, yes. Okay. I, I was listening this morning. I took a, a okay. morning walk, put the, the headphones on, which is rare for me, and literally finished just as I was getting back into my yard. I'm like, oh, this is perfect timing. This is great. Um have you managed to keep them out of the family business or are they actually looking at art more seriously? Well, we we made it a sort of family business for the the kids book, which started as a story I made up for them. Mm -hmm. But then over the years, they read the many drafts of it and looked at every page in it uh, because I, I'm i slightly colorblind. I might have mentioned that last time. No. I have a bit of red-green colorblindness. So I, I have to be careful with the colors I use. And I think that's why, left to my own devices, the colors I use are on the kind of desaturated... I was, was going to say, the, the, I don't want to say the blues, but I'm, I'm thinking a moon cop in particular with mm. that, uh, you know, the, the, the blue and, and indigo and, and... Well, never mind. Anyway. Well, yeah, I think um, that's why I'm drawn to on, in the graphic novels to just um, not really dealing with color, just choosing one tone in yeah. Goliath it's brown in, in there it's moon cop uh, in moon cop it was blue um so every page of the graph of the of the kids book came home with me and we looked at it together and they gave me notes on what needed to be brighter or darker so it, it, it did become the family business and that book is very much a, a family my wife helped and and we you know a kids book you need to needs to sound good read out loud if it's going to be yeah. a good bedtime story so i read it to them one of my daughters actually found an extra comma that had been added and we took that out so they they they, they were involved in that uh the younger one's quite into art at school she's she's 14 so she's still weighing up her choices but she's not like i was which was there was no question of what i was going to do once by 14 i was just going to art school and, the, and there was no question in my mind that I would possibly do anything else. I think once I realized that if you wanted to draw all day, you couldn't also be a doctor or, or whatever. Yeah. That was the point where I was like, well, what job do you draw all day? At the time I thought it was a graphic designer because I didn't really understand the difference between graphics and illustration then. So that's what I thought I wanted to be. I didn't want to be a comics drawer 
I don't know why. I think I maybe just thought it looked too difficult or you, you, you needed to be really good at drawing superheroes or something. Um, so when I, all through my childhood, I, I, I wanted to draw. And by the time I went to art school, I was sure illustration was the thing to do. Yeah, when we when we talked before, you mentioned how Asterix and, and Tintin comics were mm-hmm. your, your base as a kid. Was there a point at which you, you crossed into the superhero thing? I know in America that's what it was like for people our age. It was the only comics that were out there. But, yes. You know. Well, no, what I crossed over into was war comics. There was a comic called Battle. I was kind of obsessed with wars when I was about nine or ten mm-hmm. and would play battles in the woods with my friends using pine cones as hand grenades. <laughs> as and, one does, yeah. Yes, <laughs> and there was a war comic called Battle, which had some amazingly talented people writing for it. Pat Mills and yeah. other people like that were writing, I think about three of them actually, were writing almost all the stories under different pseudonyms. But that I loved. And those artists all went on to write for 2000 AD, which is a British sci-fi comic yeah. from from where Judge Dredd comes. And I guess that was my equivalent of superhero world was um, was 2000 AD. Yeah. And 2000 AD led on to I was it was quite a good time for comics in the UK when I was a teenager because it led on to Deadline magazine where Jamie Hewlett's Tank Girl was. Yeah. And that was a weird time when comics were kind of cool. And Deadline was a mixture of interviews with the cool indie bands I liked, often drawn by Hewlett or Philip Bond. So as a teenager, yeah. it, was, it wasn't quite as uncool as normal to, to be into comics. So that was good for me. Do you remember Crisis? Magazine. I, th- it was either, I do. Uh, I think I thought. I think I, I was maybe young enough that that was too rude. Yeah, and I, it, I would have been frightened. To it was take a smarty pants. There, there's yeah. absolutely esoteric Grant Morrison strip in okay. it called Bible John. It's where they also reran um, the New Adventures of Hitler when that got cancelled by someone else. Uh, okay, it, it was the yeah. late '80s, early '90s. We'll yeah. just let that go. It was a different world. Um, but yeah, it's this absolutely esoteric and strange strip. That unfortunately, I lent my my copies of that to this famous science fiction writer who is an absolute hoarder. Oh, no. I've never seen them again subsequently. Oh. He's, he's had two moves. I, I'm convinced it, it, it might be a Borges thing where those comics never actually existed, and I'm just projecting <laughs> yeah, back yeah. in time that you know, I was in college and I remember there was a strange painted strip about a serial killer. And yeah, it, uh, it it should exist even if it doesn't is is what I'm getting at. But yeah, yeah, it's um well again we we all have our our dream projects or the things we think we see along those lines you know is there when you think of doing a graphic novel nowadays are there aspects of it that you think i couldn't have done this 10 years ago are there skills or other aspects of comics making that you feel you're you're better prepared for or is it simply you know i would have figured it out 10 years ago i think i was i don't know it's difficult to know if i was more fearless then mm-hmm. I look back and see oh I didn't really know what I was doing here but I just got on with it mm-hmm. and I think the problem the problem that can happen as your career goes on is you do get better but also your standards get higher and you think oh I couldn't I, I sometimes have ideas and think oh that'd make a great story but I couldn't I couldn't draw that yeah um interesting and and I so but then I do have a feeling that perhaps the things you can't do help push your work in an interesting way as much as the things you can do, the things you're trying to avoid because you're not good at them. Um, So, you know, a lot of my comics have stuff not happening or happening off stage in the graphic novel. And partly that's because those things seem out of my skills to portray on paper. So Goliath, you know, not really seeing any battles or it's, it's all very quiet and happening in the wilderness with just one or two characters is partly because I'm, I'm, I'm not great at drawing very complicated um, interactions between people. So I like to keep it to simple two or three characters talking in a panel. So, so then I end up writing a book, which is like that. And people are like, Oh, I love the minimalism, minimalism of it. So what, no, I think the difficulty I have now, which I've always had with the longer books, is what should the story be? Mm-hmm. I meet people who, you know, car- writers and cartoonists who are like, oh, I've only got so much of my life left and I've got all these stories I want well, to tell. Seth. I mean, yeah. he literally was measuring out how many books are feasibly left to him. Yes. You know? 
And I think there's something he's done very well where I, I feel after each project, I'm, I'm back to square one, completely finished, and I have to build up from the ground. But his, almost all his work is one big project. And maybe that's a, maybe that's a way I should treat it. But yeah, that thing of starting a project, convincing myself that this book is worth making is the trickiest part, which is why I'm sort of, what I want to be is, is, is halfway into the book, making pages. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, first of all, you have to start the book. Start yeah. the book. <laughs> Welcome to my hell. Um, I, I was thinking as you're describing everything with Goliath, I follow Andy Watson's Patreon ever since we recorded uh, mm. a year or so ago, and he posts work in progress from this children's uh, uh, book that he's doing, Punicorn. And I mean, he's, he's got these battle scenes. He's like, I wish I had thought about this before I, I wrote the script because I'm really hating drawing this, this two-page spread with all of these little figures and, and everybody's... You know. Yes. Yeah. But that's good in a way because I think, you know, the, the other thing is you, 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 you write for yourself to be the illustrator and you go too far in the, in the other direction and, and don't challenge yourself. Whereas something, writing something and then coming to draw and think, ah, me in the past, why did you come up with this idea? <laughs> but if it's the right thing and you're stuck and you have to figure that out, then that's, that's a good thing. So he, I think he's doing it right, even if he's annoyed with himself. Oh, yeah. I mean, that, that self-annoyance is part of his character. That, that you yeah. know, plays in. And then it makes for the, a fun Patreon post. And but... then some days you have the opposite, where you've, you've written yourself a real treat of something you like to draw. Um, and and that, that's the fun thing of writing for yourself, is you can, you, can, you know, in my, in my kid's book, I wanted to have a scene where you're inside a room and there's just piles of amazing, crazy stuff on shelves. So I wrote two characters who were inventors and have workshops. And, and those days of just like, oh, what else should I put on this shelf? Was like a treat, which made up for the difficult days when I had to draw a smile or whatever. <laughs> and with the longer works, do you, do you work sequentially? Or are there pages out of sequence, essentially? Like, yeah, let me just work on that one for a while. I'll get back to the, the story itself in... Well, so far on on my two graphic novels, I started. I, I, yeah, I, I, I write a script and then I pencil it kind of from start to finish. But then I start inking about a third of the way in because you always, I think, get a little, or I, I get a little better as I go on, and I don't. I sort of think if if I if I draw it slight, if I ink it slightly out of sequence, then that is less apparent hmm. the change. Um, but I don't know. I don't think my process of making graphic novels is very good. And I'm always looking on how to improve it. I mean, I think I've got a good system for making my weekly strips, which feels comfortable and I enjoy. And the graphic novels, even though I love making them and really want more than anything else for them to be good, it's a more painful process. Did you rework anything in the, uh, the new collection? Or are they as is? There were a few that I think there's a small handful that were reworked because I liked them, but they were in the old size from the old oh, okay. paper. So yeah. I, I, I sort of cobbled together longer versions of a handful. And apart from that, just D and Q were good at copy editing yeah. in a way that on a weekly paper, you're, everyone's too busy to do that. So they'll spot a spelling mistake, but the seeing them all together D and Q will say, well, some of your titles end with a full stop, some don't, some have a comma. Yeah. What's the system? And I have to go, ooh, there isn't a system. <laughs> Nobody caught it. That's yeah. why. <laughs> let's, ha let's have a system for the yeah. book. So there's no, stuff like nothing that. Nothing where you redrew characters for the sake of, I just never like that pose. You know? No, yeah. because I think if I did, I'd, I'd redraw the whole, the whole thing. thing yeah. And then <laughs> I'd learn something drawing it and look at it and think, oh, I could do that again. And I'd never end. Yeah. I remember Jason Lutz was saying that uh, I think it was one of his students at a uh, CCS who caught uh, basically a character in Berlin had an extra arm. <laughs> he just didn't notice like when he first yeah, because he's, so much of it was black and white and, yeah. that, and he just happened to have this this you know then drew another and he couldn't notice through the jacket. Wait, there's another arm sticking out. And, yes, yeah, had to fix that for the, uh, the the collection, I guess. But yeah, I think in my first book there's a book with the title which, in order for you to read it, it's on the. It's on the back of the. It's on the, yeah. the the back of the book, not the cover, and 
I can't remember why we didn't change that. I think it involved redrawing the whole story. And I thought, it's just a joke. People will forgive me. Or, or they'll enjoy finding the extra arm. Uh, so, <laughs> so in the end, I left that. See, Marvel back in the 70s had no prizes. If you caught a continuity error or something, you had to mail in to them at the letters column. And you got literally a no prize, uh, which is basically the editor saying, yeah, thanks for telling us we're crap at our jobs. <laughs> but, you know. Enjoy the the literary ones more than the science ones at this point, or is it still, you know, um, not that you should pick favorites, and all of your children are are absolutely yes. perfect, but you know, <laughs> I I enjoy the fact that I'm doing them both because if I had to do two literary ones a week, it would I I couldn't do that. So yeah. so the change is good, and I I think the literary ones more often turn into stories. The science ones that I can I can sometimes be a bit more conceptual, or I can mm, sometimes sometimes they can yeah be more conceptual or idea based, which is which is kind of fun. Um, and I think probably the literary ones are slightly harder to do. I mean, I thought I would have thought the science ones would be harder because. I knew I, I knew you know nothing, nothing about, about or I haven't yeah. been educated in science. Yeah. But I think I suppose with the science ones, the science exists, and I can tell jokes and stories about it. The literary ones, there's already a story, so I, I, I guess I'm there's less space for me to fill. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, re I really enjoy doing them both, and I, I'm always thinking, oh well, one of these magazines will have a, sh a reshuffle and get rid of me. And I sort of wonder, I wonder which one I'd prefer to just, if I was just doing one. And I, I can't decide, actually. I, I, find, I find them both interesting in different ways. And the fact that science saved the day over the last couple of years is to feel pretty good that you're, you know, just somehow tied Vaguely into that connected. world. Just like, yeah. I have the same thing with pharma. Like the, the guys I work with make the vaccines for mm. the drug companies. So I feel like... You know, a little tiny way I help save the world, so it's it's kind of <laughs> yeah. nice. That... Well, no, it was fun. It was a funny time when big drug companies. We were hearing good news about them for a change, yeah. which was um, kind of unusual to my ears. Oh yeah, yeah. No, it's always whenever I have congressional meetings, I always explain. My guys just make drugs for drug companies. We have nothing to do with pricing or weird clinical trials or mm. anything else like that. We're, we're just like the printer for a, a publisher. We just make the thing. So yeah. please don't call me in front of Congress and shout at me. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, well, it's a very different life than the podcast. I'll tell you that much. Yeah. But yeah, it was very interesting seeing the, the well, the change as it happened and then the, you know, reflexive uh, attacks on science and everything else that's also occurred, mm. which, uh, the past couple of years have taught us a lot of things about human nature, frankly. It's been a, a kind of interesting all around. But yeah. a question that, that, you know, when you mentioned um, coming up with your own ideas, it, it's something we talked about in, in 2016. Have you reached a point where you laugh at your own strips yet, or are you still just, hmm, I guess that's kind of funny? No. Okay. I mean, I, I've, I've reached a point where I, know, where I know I feel very happy when I've come up with something that I know works. Um, but... The problem I've realized is the more you work on something, the further you get away from it being fresh. And the thing I have to tell myself is the person who reads this will not have spent, as I have, 24 hours thinking about the best way to organize these words to get the funniest word at the end of the sentence or whatever incredibly technical aspect has taken over. Um, so sometimes I've... I don't find the cartoon at all funny by the time I'm sending it in. In fact, sometimes I, I'm sort of convinced that it's absolutely terrible and it's, <laughs> it's the one that will get me fired. And then I'm delighted when it goes into the world and people see it fresh the way maybe I saw it when I first had the idea and thought this will make a good cartoon. And it's kind of a relief to, to think, oh, yes, that was funny. But <laughs> you can't keep laughing at something. But it does sound like you have a... I don't want to say uh, lack of self-confidence, blah, blah, blah. But just the, um, as you mentioned, going back to square one after each project, mm. as opposed to sort of building on things. And, and, you know, it sounds like you trust yourself, at least when the, the process is beginning. But it's always that, that doubt by the end that, I guess, just comes from overworking things, as I always experience, which is why I don't actually finish anything I ever start writing. Not yes. that this is about me, but... <laughs> 
<laughs> but also, the other problem with the joke is if you if I was to take them home and say to my wife, "Is this funny?" That's almost like a whatever experiment that by being by viewing it you you spoil it. If you ask someone, "Is this funny?" and sort of look hopefully at them, there's no way in the world they're going to find it funny because you've kind of put them on tenter hooks and made sure. them anxious, and they can't have a natural reaction to it. So. You know, apart from me and the editor at the Guardian, generally nobody has seen these cartoons before they're printed because it wouldn't help me to 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 canvas opinions unless unless there was some sort of can you tell me what's happening in this panel? Oh yeah, like structural, sort of te- technical visual stuff. Yeah, yeah. Or you know, I did one with some made-up German compound words <laughs> that my yeah, that my German friend Frank assisted me on uh so so when i need help i do ask for it but most of the time i just trust this is either funny or it'll be one of those weeks when it's weird rather than funny but yeah that's all right you have an audience they trust you you know it's 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 okay they get the this is tom strip this is you know well i hope so and yeah. that's what i always loved about Gary Larson's Farside cartoons was even the ones that were just insane. Cow tools. Cow tools. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's still the one that he still and, yeah. he still thinks is funny, and it's still yes. no, that's bizarre. And I, but I, it was just I was happy to go back to his world and to look at the cow tools and not to get it. But yeah. it didn't sort of doesn't matter because he you you trust him and you love his work, and even the the, the ones which are perhaps less funny than the others are another little excursion into that world. And I, I like that idea. Hmm. It reminds me years and years ago when I recorded with Sam Gross and mm. he just threw a bunch of that week's strips in front of me when we finished up because I asked about look day and, and you know, how, yes. oh, yeah, these are a bunch of ones I run in last week. And I'm going through and some of them, you know, okay, a little smile, a little guffaw. And he had one that I just burst out laughing. And I was like, motherfucker, he's, you know, it was just a bunch of scientists running out of a lab with this this thing, this big gigantic cell coming off of a, a, a beaker with little feet, mm. and one of them says, "Well, thank God it's not airborne." And, <laughs> yeah, and it was just like, "Okay, you 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 nailed it with this one. You're still in your 80s, cranking out these you know yeah. seven or eight great strips a, a week." And, and well, it's a, it's complete. What's funny about that New Yorker style is it's so different from how I do it. Um, I, 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 I didn't know any cartoonists when I was studying, or I didn't even know many cartoonists when I started working at The Guardian. I certainly, sure. certainly didn't know any gag cartoonists. And that idea of pitching a number of ideas and hoping one of them will be picked up is not how I do it at all. And I think for me, the fact that something is going to have to get printed, however bad... It's going to have my name on it. It's going to have yeah. my name on it. It's, mm-hmm. It sort of helps me make them. And I have this thing I say to myself, if I don't have a great idea, I have to take my least bad idea and polish it up to make this week's cartoon because The Guardian will be furious if nothing is published there. And that helps me just commit to sending something. Although the blank white space makes an obvious Beckett joke, too. Oh, that's true. <laughs> Someday that's true. you'll have to throw that one in, or maybe that'll yeah. be the final strip. But do you keep uh, files of, of ideas that are, okay, I'll work on those at some point? Or is it does it tend to be, you know, within a couple of weeks of, of when you come up with something? No, I've got a lot of sketchbooks full of ideas. And I have a, a little sketchbook I carry in my pocket, a bigger sketchbook I carry in my bag, and a, a section of notes on my phone. And I've realized I write down absolutely everything. However, 1% of a bad idea is sort of the, could be the beginning of something. Gotcha. So I'm, I'm, I sort of treat it a little bit, I think of it like compost that the, <laughs> that the ideas can perhaps grow out of. So I, I'm slightly obsessive about noting everything down. And when I'm stuck, I go back through the old things. I'm always hoping there'll be a perfectly made cartoon that I just didn't realize was there, which there never has been so far. But there's some, (laughs) there's sometimes something where I think, oh yeah, there's something there I can. And, and, and then I'm started and that's getting started is often the hardest part. Yeah. Not Nietzsche, but Beckett again with the the advent thing. I'm sure it it had incarnations or versions before you get there. So, but, um, what it'll sound weird, but getting into the, the the pandemic mode, you know, what did you really miss the most? Like during all of the the various lockdowns and, and all this, was it just the 
getting out and seeing the world, getting into to bookstores or, or libraries? Was there anything in particular that it was just, my God, I really want to get back to X? Yeah, I think it was being in busy London. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I a lot of my work time is spent on my own at the desk with a podcast on cross-hatching or with nothing on thinking of ideas. I mean, nothing on music-wise, I'm wearing yeah. clothes. Um, but just when I get stuck walking into London, getting a coffee, going to the British Museum or Gosh Comic Shop or uh, the Tate and seeing some art, and even if it doesn't relate to what I'm making, just that, that feeling of being around stuff happening. And I, I enjoyed some of the elements of being shut away in the quiet countryside. But when we came back to London and things reopened, I thought, yeah, this is, this is what I like. And I like that feeling of being around stuff happening. And it, it sort of helps me come up, with, come up with ideas. I've enjoyed being here in New York and walking around and looking at things and noting down ideas. So it's, there's something about the busyness of life that can, can help. Did your relationship with your readers change during that time? Did people, I'm envisioning people just, I just wait for Tom Strip during the week and, and this is the, the thing that I, you know, we started building rituals and habits mm. in certain ways. Did you notice anything like that in terms of a changing relationship with, with readers? That's an interesting question. Um, maybe a little, because I think, I think for my cartoons are not very personal or emotional. They're, 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 they're quite restrained in that sense and they're certainly not about my life but because me and the readers and we were all going through this thing together I think there was maybe an added connection which which the cartoons had in those times and hopefully I can learn from that and keep going generally so there was a bit of that and I guess we were all spending more time on our computers sharing things so may, maybe there was more connection made I'm not sure yeah, it's it's uh, I've noticed different types of listeners or things that listeners are picking up on with the show mm. in a sense of like building a more personal connection somehow with, you know, hearing me put out these things every week. It, it changed with some of the, the, the listenership over these two and a half years. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. God. But yeah, it's um, one of the key themes of the show to me has been, you know, how artists relate to the, the audience they're working with and you know, how much is the gestalt of not just the artist and the, the piece of art, but, you know, what it means to to create something for consumption for, for people. Yes. Well, when I start, when, you know, when I started doing these Guardian cartoons, they weren't being put on the Internet. So I would get nothing. I'd send it to my editor. And if he was too busy to say, thanks, Tom, then I'd hear nothing. And it would be published in the paper. And very occasionally someone would write a letter into the paper about the cartoons. But... It's very different now where they where the the Guardian is putting them online and I'm sharing them on things and people are commenting and you know what one of the reasons the book's called Revenge of the Librarians was I realized whenever I put librarians in a cartoon that the library world just went wild <laughs> and there's a real <laughs> network of librarians who love sharing these cartoons and I loved how warmly they were received um and so I thought like I, I was looking through the through the book for a title which I usually just take from one of the cartoons, and I realised there, there was there was one about librarians taking over. So even though it's not a direct quote uh, quote from that cartoon, I thought "Revenge of the Librarian" sounds good and sort of uh, dramatic. So kind, <laughs> kind of the opposite of the cartoons in there, but that's fine. And whose idea was it to have a, a, che a checkout card for the the book itself? That was. Somebody at Drawn Quarterly, they, 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 there was a little bit of them discussing whose idea it was, and I'm, I'm not sure they've quite figured out who initially suggested <laughs> it's it. It's ingenious. I mean, it when is, I opened it up, it was this their, little, little pouch to take the card out. And... It was their idea rather than mine, and I wasn't sure about it immediately. I thought, was that too gimmicky? But then we did it, and it looks great, and people seem to like it, and it's fun. It's yeah. just a, a little extra fun thing in the front of the book. Uh, although I realise it's it's sort of oddly dated because very few oh, it's libraries just now rubber stamp everything. things. Yeah. Although although I one thing that's been funny on this tour is every every event has had at least one librarian, and I think I had seven librarians in Ann Arbor, <laughs> and they 
started to, and somebody there said that one of their branch libraries still rubber stamped nice. books, which I thought was uh, <laughs> lovely to hear. Keeping it old school. Yeah. Last question. Who are you reading? Which I know I should have warned you about because everybody yes. hates drawing a blank on this one. But well, no, I'm. I, I'm. Besides I came, all the comics people are giving you. Yeah, yeah, I came on this tour with a small rucksack. Well, not a small, a trund, you know, one of those wheelie suitcases, but not a huge one, and two weeks of clothes in it. So I didn't have much space, and I've already filled all my, um, all my book space, partly because. We got taken some amazing bookstores and things. So I'm reading uh, Birds of Maine by Michael DeForge, which I'm loving. Uh, I just bought Sammy Harkham, the final part of his comic Crickets, mm -hmm. which I think is one of the most amazing stories of recent years. I'm really looking forward to reading that. Um, and in a little, oh no, a huge eccentric bookstore in Detroit, I got a couple of books by William Goldman, who yeah. is one of my favorite authors. His book, The Inheritors, about cavemen, is one of my favorite books. So I bought a copy of that, even though I own it already, just because it was such a nice little yeah. paperback. And I found some essays by him, which I've never read. So that was that was nice. It was the Detroit one that, uh, that, that I forget the building. Um, it is John King books. Yeah. yeah. I, I've seen the pictures and, uh, Bob Eckstein painted it for his, uh, world's greatest bookstores, uh, ah, book. Okay. But yeah, that's one of those. My Michigan trip was only Grand Rapids. I didn't get out to Detroit or Ann Arbor. So, well, it's yeah. where it's worth, it's more or less worth going to Detroit to see yeah. that bookstore, which was amazing. And if, if I, well, it was probably just as well. I only have a small bag or I would have spent all my money in there. See, the joke, and this will go back to my greatest episode of all time, even though, of course, they're all super wonderful, uh, was Clive James. When we recorded, I think it was after we finished up, he mentioned one of the things he missed when he was sick that he couldn't travel mm -hmm. anymore because he would come to New York, go to the Strand, uh, the great bookstore yeah, just yeah. below uh, Washington Square, and or just below uh, um, Union Square, and drop a thousand or two thousand bucks on books. Wow. And then have them all shipped back to, to Cambridge. Yeah, yeah. And it would take like six to eight weeks. And he would forget. Oh, it's and like I, buying yourself a present. That was it. He'd open up, oh, what are they, all these wonderful books somebody <laughs> decided to send me? And all, all the things I've ever wanted. And he would just pull all these great pieces out. Yes. So that's my way of saying I could offer to ship your books back for you. But, you know, I figure it's probably for the best if you, you know, have to keep things relatively constrained. Yes, but, no, it is. But, Tom, thanks so much for coming on. I enjoyed the hell out of the book. And, uh... And I'm glad you're out and, and touring. It, it gives me a little hope for uh, getting out there myself. Well, thank you very much. I'm really happy to, to be out and about with the book. Yeah. And that was Tom Gauld. His new book, Revenge of the Librarians, is out now from Drawn and Quarterly. And it really is a delight. His combo of, of humor and literary acumen is, is just, well, it's just dynamite. Now, Tom's on Twitter and Instagram as Tom Gauld, all one word, which is T-O-M-G-A-U-L-D. And his website is TomGauld.com, also one word. He's also on Tumblr, of all places, at MyJetpack.Tumblr.com, where he posts each of his current strips, as well as news about his tours and, and his children's book and, and other stuff. I would goof on someone using Tumblr, but for God's sake, I post all of my art to Flickr, so I really can't talk. Anyway, I'll have links to all of that in the show and episode notes for this one. Now, you can support the Virtual Memory Show by telling other people about it. Just tell them there's this podcast coming out every week with really interesting conversations with fascinating creative people. You can also help out the show by telling me what you like and don't like about it, uh, who you'd like to hear me record with, what movie or TV show, book, music, uh, piece of theater, art exhibition, whatever you think I should turn listeners on to. And you can do that by email, by DM, if we're connected on Twitter or Instagram, um, by postcard, I love postcard, uh, letter, or by leaving me a, a message on my Google Voice number, which is 973 Eight six nine nine six five nine. That goes directly to voicemail, so you don't have to worry about getting stuck in an awkward conversation with me. And messages can be up to three minutes long. 
So if you go longer than that, you get cut off. You'll have to call back and, and leave another message. And let me know if uh, you do leave a message, if it's okay to include it in an upcoming episode of the show. You might say something neat that the listeners would love to hear, but I would never include something like that without the uh, speaker's permission. So, so let me know. Now, if you've got money to spare, um, don't give it to me. My, my day job treats me fine. I mean, it drove me into the ground for the, the previous five weeks, but all things considered, it, it treats me fine financially. And, um, and really, my expenses for the podcast are pretty minimal. This one ran me up a little bit because I had to drive out to Brooklyn, and uh, that was something. But anyway, what I'm saying is uh, give money to other people and other institutions. For people, you can go through GoFundMe, Patreon, Kickstarter, Topato Go, Crowdfunder, and, and other crowdfunding platforms. And if you're looking for somewhere to start with institutions or foundations, I give to my local food bank, uh, occasionally give to the Poor People's Campaign, uh, Freedom Funds. I make targeted election contributions. Uh, there are other things you can do to, to, well, to try to help build a better world. So um, I hope you will. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth. Use with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and tunein.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, Talk it up on social media and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. Now you've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going. 